Thank you. So I found my mouse in the room that I left it in. But for some reason my my just all of a sudden my touchpad, my mouse pad on the computer just stopped working. So I'm going to have to troubleshoot that. There we go. And the buttons on it. Uh, the, yeah, it's weird. But when I boot up, it works. But as soon as, like, Windows opens and everything, it stops working. Really strange. I'll have to figure out. I'm going to have to look into it. I think it's a driver problem. But I went in and updated the driver. It didn't seem to do anything. I, that's probably my next step. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, really? Okay, we're all here. Good. All right. So I, I I wanted to start today with a quiz, but I'm gonna I'm gonna opt not to. All right. Um, but let me tell you, here's here's what I would have asked you to do. I would have said um, let f of x be equal to the function x squared. Find f prime of x. That would have been it. That would have been the quiz. That's it. It would have been a real quick quiz. So let's see if you would have known how to do this. So what would I do? Uh, you're still you're cheating. You can't do that yet. Use the second formula, right? Use limit x approaches. I'm oh, sorry. H approaches 0, F of X plus H minus F of X all over H, right? That's what you would have used. And so we would have replaced the X in our function, the X here, with first X plus H, right? Because that's what I'm doing here. So it would look like this, X plus H squared, and then I would have replaced this piece here with just f of x, which is x squared, and then I would have done all over h. I would have expanded the x plus h, so I would have squared it, and that would have given me limit. Notice my limit is sitting out here in front. Just bring it the whole time. Plus 2xh plus h squared. So that's this expanded. Then minus x squared still there, all over h. x squareds would have canceled out. This would have left you with, let's see, take an h out. Now cancel your h, and you're left with limit h goes to 0 of 2x plus h, and now let h go to 0. And you get 2x. That would have been it. Right? So what this means, all right, what this, what this means is that if you look at the notes from last class, 
remember, here's the x squared function, right? Its derivative is what? We just said 2x, which is that line. So what, what's really happening here is this. If I were to go to a point on the x squared function, like let's say, let's say I go to the value of, of 1. Okay, so what do I get? What do I get when I plug one into x squared? I get one, right? What do I get when I plug one into the derivative of x squared? You get two times one, which is two. So geometrically, if I go to the point on the red curve and I look at the slope of the tangent line, the slope there would be two. Yes, this is what we talked about last class. And so the con we have a we have a connection now between the parabola and its derivative in this you know visually we have a, a connection. So what today is going to be about is we are going to finally rid ourselves of the limit and we're going to get shortcuts to getting derivatives without having to do limits anymore. And they're called our 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 formulas for derivatives. Now, before I can get to the formulas, the shortcuts, I, I need to wrap up what we did last time. We talked a little bit about notation, different ways you can say, hey, take the derivative of something. We said that sometimes a function doesn't have a derivative somewhere. So sometimes you can have a function that you draw it, but then you try and take derivative at a point and the derivative doesn't exist. And what were the examples? When is it that you have a derivative not exist? Corners, right? Jumps in the graph, vertical tangent lines. And I gave you examples of each one. There's a corner, there's a jump, there's a vertical tangent line. But there was an interesting theorem that I really went by really quickly. Last class right here, I said it's a big theorem. Differentiability implies continuity. So in a Cal 1 class like this, when we talk about continuity, our definition of continuity meant you can draw it without picking up your pencil. That's basically what it meant. If, I, if you say a function is continuous on an interval, that means when you draw it, you can draw it without any jumps or anything in, you know, from one point to the, to the end of the function without lifting your pencil. Yes, no asymptotes or anything like that. No holes. So this theorem says if your function is differentiable, it must be continuous. What it does not say is that if it's continuous, it must be differentiable. Here's an example of a function that is continuous, right? I can draw it without picking up my pencil. But it fails to be differentiable where? At zero, right? Now, it's differentiable everywhere else, right? Because I can find the slope of the tangent line on this curve until I get to that little corner. Now, is this function continuous? Well, it's continuous and there's a jump, right? But everywhere it's differentiable, it's continuous. So there was, there was a question that was posed many, many, many years ago. Mathematicians wanted to know, is there a function that is continuous, right? Continuous but nowhere differentiable. Is it possible to draw a function without picking up your pencil, but never be able to take the derivative anywhere? Hmm. And, it, and it boggled mathematicians for a long time. So let me try and reiterate what I'm saying. Is this function continuous? Yes. Is it differentiable everywhere? No, there is a point where it fails to be differentiable. So this is an example of a continuous function that is, that is not differentiable at one point. Yes? Okay, here's, here's another, I'm going to draw another picture for you. Is that function continuous? Okay, is it differentiable everywhere? No, it's not differentiable at every single one of these little corners, right? 
So what mathematicians did is they came up with this function, and it looks like this. Okay, that's a continuous function. There are certain points where it's not differentiable, yes? But if you zoom in on this function, you see this piece right here? If we blow that piece up, like zoom in on it, it would look like this. Just that piece would look like this. Okay? So it looks continuous still, right? But now you have even more places where it's not differentiable at all those little points, right? Now, if you take one of those little pieces and you zoom in on that piece, guess what it looks like? The same thing. And if you zoom in on each one of those little pieces, what do they look like? Little things like that. And what we actually came up with was an example of a function that is continuous but nowhere differentiable. It's like a saw blade, and each one of the teeth on the saw blade is a little saw blade, and each tooth on that saw blade is a saw blade, and then does that make sense? And it's infinite. So I won't tell you what it's called. I'll let you go look it up. If you look at the actual function, well, you know what? We have the Internet. Let's just do it right now. Because this is what you would do at home. So I would type in here a continuous, nowhere differentiable, that's probably all I need, a continuous nowhere differentiable function. Let's see, just the first thing that comes up. Whoa, what the hell is this? That's the name of it right there, Weierstrass function. But this is Wikipedia, so you can never tell what you're going to get with Wikipedia. Okay, there it is right there. So you can see they zoomed in on one little point. It's a bunch of little saw blades. But I'm at, there's the function. There it is. So what it is, is, see, A is a number, B is a positive integer. So this is really just a cosine function, right? But it's the sum, this means sum, and, and you'll study this more in, in Cal 2. This is a sum, it's an infinite sum. Actually, we'll study it eh, towards the end, maybe, of this class. Um, it's not just one cosine function, it's a cosine function plus another cosine function plus another cosine function forever. And if you evaluate this function, then you create the saw blade thing. All right, so just wanted you to see that. It doesn't really bear any relevance here in our class, all right? Just a fun fact, exactly. But going back to the theorem, I want to make sure that you understand we did not violate the theorem. Theorem says if you're differentiable, you had to be continuous, right? The Weierstrass function is an example of a continuous function that is nowhere differentiable. So just because you're continuous does not imply continuity. Oops. What did I just say? Hold on. Just because, just because you're continuous does not mean you'll always be differentiable, right? Now, if you're differentiable, you must be continuous. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, some more notation. We talked about when you take the derivative, we use this little prime mark, right? And I talked about how the derivative is the first time you've ever in your life heard of this thing called a functional operator takes a function in, spits a new function out, right? Well, that new function it spits out, why not just take the derivative of that now, right? And it would spit out a new function. And then why not take the derivative of that? So what happens is you start with the fu a function f, you take its derivative, we call it the first derivative. But if you wanted to take that function f and take its derivative twice, that would be the second derivative. So we use a double prime. If you want to do three derivatives successively, right, derivative, 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 then that would be the third derivative. And then obviously the prime marks don't make sense at some point, right? You don't have eight prime marks up there. So what we do is we change notation and we go to writing the function f and then a power up there, but not, not the power that you've always used in the past. Like if you write down, if I write down f, 
to the fourth versus F parenthesis four, those mean completely different things. F with a four like this means take the function and raise it to the fourth power. So if you had like x squared, that means take x squared, raise it to the fourth power, which would be x to the eighth power. This does not mean take it to the fourth power. This means what? Take four successive derivatives of f. So do you see the parentheses shows you it's a derivative versus no parentheses is just powers. So there's the fourth derivative, fifth derivative, and you, you can imagine that you can just keep on going, right? The nth derivative. Now, using Leibniz notation, it gets kind of ugly. Remember, there's Newton's notation and Leibniz notation. If we want to say dy dx, right, that was the first derivative. How do I say second derivative with Leibniz notation? I write d with a little squared y and then dx squared. And notice that the squareds are offset. You see that? There's a reason for that. Here's the reason. If I write dy squared dx squared versus d squared y dx squared, the offset, and here no offset, makes a huge difference. This just means what? What do you think this means? I'll rewrite it. Isn't this really kind of the same thing? What does this mean? Square the derivative. Take the der first derivative, right, and then square it. Versus this, which the offset tells you, that means second derivative. It's so you don't get confused with the two notations. And then third derivative, you go three here, three here, fourth derivative, four, four, and so on. Okay, see the difference? All right. Now, how is this connected to some of the things we've talked about? Remember that we said in, the, in, I think it was last class, maybe the one before, that if we know the position of an object, then the first derivative represented velocity. I, I did this at the beginning of class. I said you could draw, you could draw, you know, time here. You could say distance here. Then if you draw a curve, the slope of the tangent line would give you the speed, right? It would be the distance divided by time. Yes? So we already said that if you take the derivative of a function, it gives you a new function, right? So what if I graph that down here? So let's say this new function right here happens to be the derivative of this one up here. So this one up here is f. And then I take its derivative. That gives me a new function. I graph it then my x-axis is still time, but my y-axis was what? The speed, right? The derivative was the speed. So now what you have here is, I'm going to put velocity. Although velocity and speed are different things once you get into physics. They're different quantities. Or they're different. They're completely different. How many of you know that? Speed and velocity are different things, right? Speed is a magnitude of a vector. Velocity has direction and magnitude. So, but that's beyond this. We're not getting there. We're not going there. So tell me this. If, if f is distance versus time and its derivative gives you velocity, we can draw that and have velocity versus time. Then what does the second derivative give you? The, remember, what was this? Distance over time, right? This one will be? Velocity over time, and velocity over time is acceleration. Because you can look at velocity as distance over time, and then over time. So you get that distance over time squared, which is basically what acceleration is. So when we graph the second derivative, or if I look here and I take the tangent line here, that slope, would be equivalent to the acceleration, right? That's the acceleration. Where the one up here was what? That slope is velocity. And that's what, that's what this note is saying here. I just want to give you sort of a visual of it first. So 
If S equals F of T gives the linear displacement, displacement or a position of an object as a function of time, then the derivative of that function we call V of T for velocity function is the instantaneous velocity of the um, the instantaneous velocity function. Now again we take the derivative and that creates the acceleration function, A of T. Instantaneous acceleration. Okay? Now what's cool about this in, well in Cal one we we all have to leave here understanding that if someone gives you where an object is at every point in time you, sh you should then be able to tell me its speed and acceleration at every point in time. How do you do it? You take the first and second derivatives, right? That's what you do. In Cal 2, what you do is you start with acceleration, and you say, go tell me where this thing is. So you try and recover this up here. So you have to kind of go backwards from here back up to here, and then from here back up to here. So we call that in Cal 2 the antiderivative to go backwards. But that that's what my Cal 2 is taking a test on on Monday. And they could they they will tell you it's not easy to do antiderivatives. Very difficult. All right, so that's it for this. That's it for for this section. We're going to move into 2 3 now. All right? might be it might be worth it for us to do to entertain one quick question do you think that when you take a derivative and then follow it by the second derivative and then the third derivative do you think that every time you do it the function that you get out is going to get more simple each time you do it do you think it could get easier as you take derivatives like, we started with, like, let's say x squared, right? We took the derivative, and what did we get? 2x. 2x is nicer than x squared in terms of, like, you know, you learn about lines before you do parabolas. If we do the derivative again, we're going to wind up getting 2, the number 2. And if we do the derivative again, we're going to get 0. And then, I'm, now, I'm just, you have to trust me on that. And then we take derivative again, it would be 0 and 0 and 0. So start out x squared, then it went to 2x, then it went to 2, then it went to 0, and then 0, 0, 0. It keeps on going, no matter how many derivatives you take. It got nicer, right? Eventually turned into zeros. In general, that doesn't work that way. You can start with the function, take its derivative, and that derivative is more complicated than the function that it started as. So I don't want you to feel like, like derivatives always turn out, you know, reducing your original function is something nice. All right, so basic differentiation formulas. So these sections right here, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6, these are vitally important sections, right? 2, 3 is the first one that is important and, and the easiest of the three that we're going to talk about. So up, up to this point, we've been using the limit, right? I say, find the derivative. Everyone comes in with the limit. h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x, all over h. And then we go mess with all the algebra. It turns out that we have a bunch of formulas, here they are, and how to compute derivatives without having to use the limit. So here's the only catch. I'm going to prove every one of these. Because as a calculus student, of course, you can't wait to have these formulas in your hand because they're going to make life much easier. But what differentiates something like, not differentiate, like de derivative, like what makes this course different than business calculus is that we don't just hand you the formulas. Like in business cal, they say, hey, we want to find the slope tangent line. Here's the formula. And they avoid the, all the rough stuff with the limits. Here, I'm not going to hand you the formula until I convince you it's true. All right? So let's go through these. Some of these will be obvious. Some of them will have to do algebraically. So let's try this first one. This first one says that the derivative of a constant is 0. The derivative of a constant function is 0. Let's see if we can convince ourselves of that with a picture. Somebody give me an example of a constant function. f of x equals 2. OK, if I graph this, it's a flat line, isn't it? 
That's what the function f of x equals 2 looks like. Now, the derivative is the slope of the tangent line at any point on that graph. So let's go pick a point. Here we go. I'll pick this one. I'll call it x. Go up here. What's the slope of the tangent line there? It's flat, right? Flat, which means the slope is 0. And that would, that would happen anywhere I go, right? Anywhere I go, the slope is 0. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so this number here, this number here, it too, is our C. So that's, that's doing it visually. I think visually we could all be convinced that that's the truth. But let's do it with a limit. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let my function f of x be equal to C. And now I'm going to compute the derivative. It is the limit as h goes to 0 of what's f of x plus h? Please be careful. If you plug x plus h right here, what does the function spit out? C. It doesn't care what you plug into it, right? This function doesn't care that you're giving it x plus h. This function only knows how to throw one thing back out, right? C. So the top left corner of the difference quotient will be C. What's the top right corner of the difference quotient? Same thing. All over h. C minus C over h. Pardon me? This is, now don't take a limit yet, okay? This is 0 over h. And do you remember how you're supposed to do all your algebraic simplification before you take the limit, like cancel things out? All right, what, what is 0, the number 0, divided by a very small number? 0. Doesn't matter, right? See, what we're saying here, C minus C, we're not saying that it's approaching 0, are we? We're saying C minus C is 0, right? So there, in, there's no limit here. So before I try and let h go to 0, I first tell myself 0 divided by any number, as long as that number is not 0, is 0. I guess what I'm trying to get you to see is that you do not want to treat this like 0 over 0. Why? 0 over 0 always in the past meant the top is going to 0, the bottom is going to 0 in the limit, right? As we approach something, they're both headed to 0. Here, that's not the case. The top is not headed anywhere. It is 0. Yeah, do you all understand the difference? You all can tell me but with the little poll question because you all give me that look, you know? You give me that Friday afternoon look. I just want to know whether or not you follow that. Okay. That's good enough. We'll keep going. All right. So the derivative of a constant is zero, right? Give you a quiz. Easy. Derivative of five is zero. Derivative of pi, zero. Derivative of e. Okay. So doesn't matter what the number is. Constant function zero. Next one. The derivative of x is one. The derivative of x is one. So now let's look at that function. F of x equals x. I'll do it graphically first. Do you know what f of x equals x looks like? It's a line, but it's, it's that special one, right? It's the identity. It's the perfect diagonal, isn't it? Very important function in mathematics. f of x equals x. You plug in 1, it spits out 1. You plug in 2, it spits out 2, right? It leaves everything you put in identical to what comes out. Now, you take a guess. If I pick a point here, x, and I go up there and I ask you what the slope of the tangent line is, what are you going to tell me? 1, right? Because what's the slope of this line? 1. So it should be the same as the slope of that line anywhere I go. Pick it, go, slope, tangent line should be 1. So does it make sense out, uh, visually that the derivative of x should be 1? Yes? Now let's confirm it with a limit. So using this, I want to evaluate the derivative by doing the limit 
this is kind of sad. You should feel a little bit depressed today because we're going to leave the limit behind for a while. And it's been good to us. So what is the top left corner? We plug in what to the function? What do we? X plus H, right? So what happens if you plug X plus H into this function? It spits out X plus H, right? Exactly what you plug in is what comes out. So the top left corner of the difference quotient is X plus H. Then you say minus F of X, which is X, all over H. Now, I'm not writing this down. I was really hoping that you're all so comfortable with this now. You realize that, you know, that's what I'm doing. Difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Now, I'm not going to take a limit yet. I'm going to do any algebra, algebraic simplification I can. What happens here? These x's cancel, which leaves me with h over h. That simplifies, right, to be a what? A 1. And now, tell me, what happens to 1 when I let H go to 0? It stays 1. H isn't even involved, right? H is no longer here. So the answer would just be 1. And that verifies that the derivative of X is 1. All right, this, this one's big time right here, the power rule. We just said that the derivative of x was 1, but what about the derivative of x squared? Derivative of x cubed, right? So it would be really nice if we had a general, a general rule that applied to all x powers, right? All powers of x. Wouldn't that be nice? All right, so I'm going to run into an issue here. The issue I'm going to run into is, what, if I'm going to try and convince you, I have to be able to first draw x to the n, right? Let me try and draw it and talk about the tangent line. What's the problem with that? x squared looks different than x cubed, and that looks different than x to the fourth, right? I mean, I can't draw you a picture and convince you with the tangent line anymore like I did in the previous two, can I? Maybe I could pick a specific n and convince you, but I don't think I could in general. So my picture is not going to work to convince you what the answer is. So I'm going to have to do it using the definition. So here I go. The derivative of this function, did I put the derivative mark on that last one? Oh, I did. Okay. The derivative of this function <clears throat> is the limit as h goes to 0 of, so first you plug x plus h into this function. What does it spit out? x plus h to the n. Then minus, you plug in x, and that's basically the function itself, right? So x to the nth power all over h. This is like the quiz, isn't it? The quiz you didn't take? <laughs> x squared, right? And then this was squared and squared. And what did you do here? You did, we foiled it out or whatever. What's wrong with this, though? Don't know what n is, so I don't know how many times I'm supposed to multiply that, right? Okay, does anyone remember what we're going to do here? When did we talk about this? Do you remember me making a triangle in here or no? The Pascal's triangle? What day was that? I should have looked this up before class. Bonus to whoever can find it first. Unless I find it first. What review day? There it is. I beat you. No, I beat you. No bonus. Day four. Okay. Day four. Okay. So what I was doing back here is trying to prep you for this, for today, for this little one piece of today. I had shown you that x plus h to the zero was one and x plus h to the one was this. And then we tried to find that pattern, right? 
And I said x plus h to the 6 would be this. And, and I tried to get you to see that if you have x plus h to a power, the first thing you're going to have is x to that power. Then plus this 6 also comes from here, right? And then the next one, the power on x came down and the power on h came up. And then the rest of it, we are actually are not going to give a crap about. But let's look at the rest here, this one right here. This means fifth power, I should have an x to the fifth, always with the 1 in front. Then I'll have plus 5, x to the fourth, h. This one, x to the fourth. Then there was a 4, x cubed, h. Yes, we see the pattern? Okay, so we didn't write it down this day because I knew I was going to come back. What would x plus h to the n look like? First thing would be x to the n plus n x to the, so the power comes down, right? So whatever this was needs to come down by 1. So I subtract 1 from it. So it's the n minus 1 power, isn't it? And then a single h next to that. Let's take a vote if you understand whether or not, you know, where that came from. I'm not done, right? There's a bunch of stuff that keeps on happening here. All right, the next number, I will concede that I, I don't know what it is, okay? But I know the power on x came down again, right? So it's x to the n, what? Minus 2. But how many h's will I have? h squared. Yes? And as I continue this, I won't know the numbers. x will be to some power. I honestly don't care about it anymore. You'll see why. And then I'll have h cubed, right? And that'll continue all the way down until my last power, is, or my last term is what? h to the n. So this will continue all the way down here until h to the n. That's what will happen if I were to expand that out. Now let me take that back to where we were in this problem, if I can find where I was. Day nine. So this is now going to become limit h goes to zero of, well, let me write that top left out. It's going to be ugly. x to the n plus n x to the n minus 1 h plus something that I didn't know, x to the n minus 2 h squared plus a bunch of stuff down here, right? All the way till I get to what? h to the n. That's just this top left corner. Then minus x to the n. All of this over what? h. And what cancels? x to the n in front and x to the n in the back. Doesn't it? Do you agree that every term that's left has at least one h in it? Yes? So if this has an h in it, and this has two of them, and this one had three, and I had n of them, then can't I factor an h out of everything? One h out of the entire top. Okay, let me do that. If I pull an h out of the top, tell me what my first term would be. n. Go ahead. x to the n minus 1. There's no h on that anymore, right? The next one, plus, I, I didn't know what it was, x to the n minus 2 times what? A single h, right? Then every single one of these down here, and until the very last one will be h to the n minus 1. That's what happens if I pull that h out. Now what happens? These H's cancel, right? This H cancels, which was the whole point of this exercise, was to get the H to cancel. And now, what's going to happen if I let H go to zero? 
everything dies off except the first one, right? Because this one has an H in it, right? The next one has an H in it. The next one has an H in it. The next one has an H in it. They all have H's. All the ones on the tail. Everything from this plus all the way down forever. I know all of those are going to go zero, 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 zero. All of them. Which leaves me with just this. And if that's the case, then after I let H go to zero, the answer is NX to the N minus one. And this is the power rule that some of you are very eager to use, right? This is where it comes from. And when you look at this power rule and we, we apply it now, you'll see just how nice it is. So, so let's, let's just kind of go back and look at the notes. It's saying the derivative of x to the n is equal to nx to the n minus 1. So the way we look at this is you just take the n, whatever the power is, right? You drop it out front, like a, like a number in front now. It's like a coefficient. And then you reduce the power by 1. If you do that, you will have taken the derivative. And that makes it super nice. So here's, here's the uh, example. I'll give you an example of the power rule here. I'm going to give you a couple of them. Let's say f of x is x squared find f prime of x. Two x, and we're done, but I'll show you. Now, you might be asking yourself this. That's the same question that he asked me on the quiz, right? So how do I know whether or not I should use the limit or use the shortcut, right? You, I know you want the sh to use the shortcut. I understand that. but you know, that's only because we've, we've, I've shown you this now. So here's what will happen. On the test, if I want you to use the limit, what I will say is, here's f of x, find f prime of x using the definition. That's all I will say. If I put using the definition in there, you have to set up the limit and suffer through the algebra. If I do not put using the definition, then you are free to use the shortcuts, the rules. So in this one, I'm not, giving, I'm not saying to use definition, so I'm using shortcut. So what's n in this problem? n is 2. And so the derivative of this should be n time, um, times x to the n minus 1, which for us is 2x to the 2 minus 1. I'm going very slow. This is going to be 2x to the first power which is just 2x. So power came out, reduced the power by 1, we're in business. Let's vote. Do you understand that or not? Okay, I, I'm happy to see that. Okay, do you like this or not? Some people don't like it. You want the limit, you want the limit back, you want to suffer. Well, we have to, you know, you've probably heard this saying before, you have to be careful what you wish for, right? Because here's what starts to make this course more difficult now, is as I give you rules that make taking derivatives easier, what happens is that now I can give you more complicated functions to take derivatives of. And so, you know, we don't just stick around with a test with 20 problems on a test that say find the derivative of x squared, x to the you know third, x to the tenth. No, that's not what happens. So we're happy, but let's let's just be ready for the rest because it you know. All right, so this extends out to pretty much anything you can think of. That's a power of x. F of x equals the square root of x. What's the derivative? All right, so first you have to be sure that you know the power of x here. So up here, what does the square root really mean? x to the 1 half power, right? That's what it means. So the n in the problem is 1 half. 
So if I want to take the derivative, the n is going to come out. So I'm just going to write this next to this right here. I'm taking the derivative down here. The n comes out, so 1 half comes out. And then it's x to the take the n and subtract 1. 1 minus a half is negative 1 half. And if you've had trouble in the past with fractions and doing that, you have got to become proficient with fractions. You've got to be able to add and subtract fractions pretty quickly. So what did we do here to do 1 half minus 1? We turned the 1 into a what? 2 over 2. And you do 1 minus 2 over the common denominator. So you get negative 1 over 2. So this will wind up being 1 half x to the negative 1 half. Everyone agree? Now, that is correct. However, we don't usually like to leave things with negative exponents. So we take it down. Now, when we say down, what I mean is this is a fraction, right? This right here is also a fraction. You could write this whole thing over 1, couldn't you? Right? You could do that whole thing over 1. And then it's like the 1 and the x here are on the same level. They're both in numerators. The 2 and the 1 down here are both on the same level. They're in denominators. So I'm going to drop this one down. So it's really going to be sitting there next to that 2 now, isn't it? So it's going to be written like this. 1 over 2. This time I changed the power to a positive, right? Positive 1 half because I've dropped it down. But what is x to the positive 1 half? Square root. Now, this comes up so often, all right, this derivative comes up so often that I recommend that you memorize it this way. Memorize it here to here, okay? It's just like if I walked in here to uh, next class and I say, what's the derivative of x squared? Everyone's like, 2x, right? If I say, what's the derivative of the square root of x? Everyone should be like, 1 over 2 root x, 1 over 2 root x. It needs to be automatic. Not all of these are going to have to be automatic, but that one should be. All right? Questions? If you look back in your notes, I'm not going to go try and find it. We did this one by hand using the definition limit. H goes to zero. We did that, and we actually did get this. All right? But we had to do what? We had to get like conjugate. We had to come in with a conjugate and do all that stuff. No need for it anymore. Next one. Huh? That's a great question. You know, why didn't we do this from the beginning? What's that? That's, that's right. I mean, that's what it comes down to is that, look, the concept of the limit is the heart of calculus. Not just Cal 1, but all calculus. Differential equations, all these different branches of math. I've seen before a really nice picture where it has the limit and it has all these like, like wheel spokes coming off of it to all the different branches of mathematics that the limit is, is the basis for. So in a Cal 1 class, you have to be exposed to the limit first. It's just, it's a higher level of thinking than just coming in here and saying, here's a bunch of formulas. Don't ask me why or what or what, the, you know, why it works. I mean, you theoretically, right, could prove to someone right now why the power rule exists, right? You could. I showed you how to do it. And that's what differentiates this calculus from a regular calculus, a business cal or something like that. I hope that answers the question. Who's, who has a question with that? Oh, yeah, that's right. But you were thinking it, no? Yes, this is, this, is, this is the beginning of real calculus. All right, what about this one? How about this one? Very similar to the one we just did. What's the difference? That's really 1 over x to the 1 half, right? 
the power rule does not allow us to create a fraction, okay? Look back at the power rule. The power rule says you must have x to a power. And the implication here is that the x to the power is sitting on the top like a numerator. It's not saying what do you do when the x to the power is down on the bottom somewhere. Do you see that? So we first have to convert this to x to a power with x being on the top. But that's okay because we've done things like that before. We are just reversing the property that if you have a ex negative exponent drops down, right? If we want to force it, if we want to force this back up, we just make it a negative exponent, don't we? So this, these two are equivalent. And now, what's n? Negative one half instead of positive one half. So let's apply the power rule. The derivative would be. Okay, so the one-half comes out in front, or sorry, negative one-half comes out in front. X to the negative one-half, and I'm going to subtract from that one. What's negative one-half? Take away one. Negative three-halves. So you have negative one-half, X to the negative three-halves. Okay, well, let me clean that up. I mean, that's okay, but maybe the back of the book's going to have something else. So watch this. I'm going to leave the negative on the 1. I'm going to put the negative on the 1 out there, leave the 2 on the bottom. I'm going to move that x to negative 3 halves down and make it x to the positive 3 halves. Is that all right? So this thing up here goes and joins the 2 on the bottom. And now, what does this really mean? What does raising something to the 3 halves really mean? It's the square root of x cubed. The square root of x cubed. So let me write this. Negative 1 over 2 times the square root of x cubed. Now, what I'm using here, in case you need to go look this up somewhere, that's not enough room. What I'm using here is this property that the mth root of x to the n is equal to x to the n over m. That's what I'm using. This is uh, back pre-algebra, like before college algebra, or maybe in college algebra. Properties of exponents, and specifically what we called rational notation, rational exponents, how you convert radical notation to rational exponents. So we have to make sure we're comfortable with that formula. So the, the number up here, n, is the power, and the, the number down here is the root. So I'm taking the square root, 2, of that cubed. And that's this. But what is the square root of x cubed? Can't you pull out? And, like, isn't there an x squared in there? Right? So you can pull an x out. So that's 2x root x. So one of the groups of x squared comes out as an x, and you've got this. Okay. Give me a yay or nay on that, please, as I move on to the next one. Okay. Uh, yes, we're good. Here's another example. f of x <clears throat> equals 1 over, or let's, well, no, I haven't told you what to do with that yet. How about the cube root of x, right? And here's what I want. Find this. So what do I want you to do? three times, triple, uh, triple derivative, third derivative, triple prime. That means we're going to take the derivative. After we're done, we're going to take derivative again. After we're done, we're going to take derivative again, three times. All right. 
So the first thing I need to do is try and rewrite this as x to a power. Can you help me with that? This is x to what power? Okay, 1 over, if you want to leave it down there first, x, x to the what? 1 third. That's what the cube root means. But you can't have it on the bottom like that if you're going to use the power rule. So x to the negative 1 third. Bring it up. And now you have your n. Your n here is what? Negative 1 third. Go ahead and apply the power rule. So f prime of x will be equal to, you tell me, negative 1 third times x to the negative 4 thirds. So you're doing negative 1 third, you're taking away 1. Negative 1 third, you're taking away 1. You're going to be doing this so, so much, that's why I was saying you need to get really like proficient with it. Negative one-third, take away one is negative one-third, take away three-thirds, which is negative one minus three over, I don't know why I put three-fourths. Right, that's what it is. So negative four-thirds. Now, do you all agree I could go and try and clean this up, like drop this down, make that the cube root of that to the fourth? Yes? Like do all that? But if I'm going to take derivative again, doesn't it make sense to, to like I already know what the power on x is here, don't I? It's, it's just glaring right there. So I'm going to just apply the rule again. The only question that we have that still remains is how do you handle the fact that you have a number in front of this. But I thought that the derivative of a constant was zero. But I have an x with it. OK, so there's another rule that we need to be aware of. OK, that's this rule. It's called the constant multiple rule. And it, let's not overcomplicate it, all right? The constant multiple rule says if you have a constant attached to a function of x, with multiplication, then what you can do is ignore the constant. Don't take the derivative of it. Just kind of write it to the side, and then do your derivative, whatever it is you're going to do. So the constant is just going to come along for the ride. The derivative of it will not be 0. But this only works if your constant is attached to a function of x. All right? Up here, this rule says the derivative of a constant by itself, not attached to any function of x, that is 0. So the reason why this one's not going to go to 0, that one right there, is because it's attached to this function of x right here with multiplication. I'm just going to write it in front. So I'm going to do this. Write negative 1 third. Bam, there it is. Now, focusing all my attention on this piece, I'm going to apply the power rule to that. So let's tell me what the n is now, because it's different than it was in the previous one. It's negative 4 thirds. So you're going to drop that out front. It's going to be times negative 4 thirds. I'm still multiplying right there, yes. So I'm saying this constant times whatever the derivative of this is, right? The derivative of this is going to be right here. What's the power? What's well, negative four thirds take away one? Negative seven thirds. And I am going to clean up this right here because this is just multiplying two numbers together. So I'm going to say four ninths x to the negative seven thirds. That's my second derivative. And now, do it again. So the third derivative, I will take this constant that was in front, 4 ninths. I'll bring it along for the ride, times, and now I'm focusing my attention on the x to the negative 7 thirds. And I'm going to bring out what number? 
Negative 7 thirds, here it is. X to what power? Negative 10 thirds. You're going negative 7 thirds, take away 1 is negative 7 thirds minus 3 thirds, which is negative 10 thirds. So we're here. Put these two numbers in the front together. You're at negative 28 over 27. X to the negative 10 thirds. I'm going to box this as my answer. Yes, I could take this and drop it to the bottom, make it a positive exponent, but what we soon realize now that we're getting into these rules as calculus students is that you've always been told don't leave your exponents negative and right, you've always been told that, but now with these new, you know, this new perspective through the calculus eyes, we actually like to just have things to powers. I don't care if they're positive or negative because if I ever need a derivative, it's quick. Does that make sense? Like, why go simplify it all into this thing where it's on the bottom if, if, uh, if to take a derivative later, I have to go back and undo that? With me? All right. So let's look at what our next rule is. The constant multiple I'm going to skip over. I'm not going to prove it with the limit, okay? You could do it on your own, but I'm not going to do it. Sum and difference rule. I don't know if I want to prove this either. You you tell me if you want me to, okay? I'm, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Do you want to see the proof or do you want to see the just see the rule in action? Proof or not? Proof is yes. No proof is no. To show you how show you how to work it, right? Okay, that's fine. All right. So for those others right there, in the twenty percent, if you want to see this, you know, I would just challenge you to try it yourself. <laughs> no, I mean, I would show you. Yeah, I mean, really, it's you're trying to show that the limit of a sum of two functions, or the difference of two functions, is equal to the sum, screw it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You don't have a choice. Look, because because so many people think it's hard that I don't want you to think it's hard. Yes. What, this? Copy this? No. This is all online. You can print all that out. It's, that's the whole point. Is the, of me putting notes out there for you so that I don't have to sit here and have you copy all these things down, that you have them, you're ready to roll. It's also on the formula sheets. So, all right. Sorry. So I'm going to try and show you right now that if you take the limit as h goes to 0, now watch the way I'm going to write this. F plus G of X plus H minus F plus G of X all over H. Okay, so this is just notation. Do you remember in college algebra we said we used F plus G to mean add two functions together? F plus G, add two functions. But I'm plugging in X plus H. I'm plugging in X to this one. I'm going to try and show you that this is the same as doing these, the two derivatives separately. So if there is plus or minus between two functions, you can split it into two derivatives. So watch. This is all I do. It's really not. It's almost so obvious, subtle, that it, it's like, what? What happened? I'm going to rewrite this as its definition from college algebra, which is f of x plus h minus, or plus, g of x plus h. That, that's what it means when I write f plus g of x plus h. It means take the f function, plug in x plus h. Add to that the g function with x plus h in it. That's what that means. 
minus, now let me write down what this is. Maybe you can help me write that down. This means what? f of x plus g of x. That's all it means, right? And then I need to put a parenthesis because of the distribution of this. All over h. Now watch what I do. I'm going to rearrange things. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to rearrange things. I'm going to take this. I'm going to put minus f of x next to it. And then I'm going to do this one, plus g of x plus h, and then distribute that negative through and put minus g of x next to it. It will look like this. Limit, h goes to 0, f of x plus h, minus f of x, then plus g of x plus h, minus g of x. All I've done is rearrange stuff. I have not done any crazy algebra or anything else. Now, if you have a fraction, tell me, if you have a fraction, like we do, and you have multiple terms on the top, can't you split this into separate fractions? I could split it into four separate fractions, couldn't I? But I'm not going to. I'm going to split it into two fractions. I'm going to split it right there. So you would put these two terms over what? H, and you put these two terms over H. And what would you have? Limit, H goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h plus g of x plus h minus g of x all over h again. So I've split it into two, haven't I? And I should put a big parenthesis here because that limit is applying to both of these, right? So now the limit laws say that if I have two things added together, all I have to do is take the limit of each one. So I'm going to write that last line down. We're done. So I'm going to put the limit on each of those. I'm going quick. I'm not really expecting that you're copying all this. I see everyone's like writing it down, but it's more of do you understand it? What is this? What is that? What is this? Does that look familiar? This is the formula for what? What is that? That's the definition of the derivative of x, isn't it? What is this? The definition of the derivative of g. What's sitting between them? Plus, what does this mean? It means if I want to take the sum of two functions and take their derivative, that I can just take the derivative of each of the functions separately and add the answer together. That's what it means. So maybe I should put at the very top of this, ah, there's no room. No, I can make a little room in here maybe. It's going to be. Uh, yeah, just a little bit, right up there. Just right above this line, put um, f plus g prime of x equals. So if you take the sum of two functions and you want to know their derivative, you set this limit up, and at the end of the day, it turns out to be these two things added together. That's what that next rule said. Sorry, 78% of you. Okay, so let me see if we can use this rule on something. Here's an example. I would like to know if f of x is equal to x cubed minus 5x to the 7th plus um, 3 square root of x plus 7, I would like for us to find f prime of x. So what I'll point out first is that we have 1, 2, 
three, four terms, right? Terms in math are separated by addition and subtraction. I have four terms. The rule that we just set, got says that if you have two terms, right, two things added together or subtracted, that you don't have to worry about some crazy complicated thing. Just break them up into two different pieces and take the derivative of each one separately. Combine the answers with addition or subtraction. So I'll test. So what I'm going to be able to do here is say, all right, to figure this out, I first need to figure out what's the derivative of x cubed. Boom. Then the derivative of this, and then this, and then this, and then put all the answers together, and that's your answer. That's it. So what is the derivative of x cubed? So I'm going to go right to this. This is going to be 3x squared. Okay. Now let's see how you do with this one. What about this negative 5 in front? Just don't, don't, don't mess. No, you're okay. It is going to be negative 35, but we're not going to do anything with that. We're going to act like it's not there, right? Just kind of hide it for a second. What's the derivative of x to the 7th? 7 comes down, x to the 6th. But that 7 that came down must multiply times that negative 5. So it's going to be minus 35 x to the sixth. Was that too much? Is that pushing too much there, or y'all are right? What about the next one? What should I do with this three? Just kind of ignore it for a second, all right? Remember, it's going to be there when I'm done. What's the derivative of the square root of x? One over two root x. One over two root x. But I'm going to have a three out front, right? So where should I put that 3? On the bottom with the 2 or on the top with the 1? On the top with the 1. So it's going to be plus 3 over 2 root x. I heard negative. Are you okay with why it's not negative? Yes? Okay. And then finally, the derivative of 7 is 0 because it's a constant by itself. Now, look, there's, some, there's something kind of subtle here. It's kind of cool if you, if you think about it. There really is an x to the 0 sitting next to that, isn't there? And if you use the power rule on that, what would happen? The 0 would come out, and it would just kill everything off, and it would be 0, wouldn't it? So that actually follows the power rule still. But all we need to know is it's plus 0. You don't even need to write it. All right, I just wanted to make sure you understood that that one went away. That's your derivative. Was there any question? Okay, so I said that everyone needs to memorize what the derivative of that is, right? 1 over 2 root x, but then the 3 was up top with the 1. All right, yes or no, are you okay with this? I have another one for you. So what I'm about to give you, this, this formula is the most important thing that I could ever tell you the entire time that you're in this class. I mean, you'll pass if you listen to this one thing. I'm kidding. I knew she was leaving. She told me she was leaving. So This is the, the, the holy grail of, of math things now. All right. So, <laughs> So what about um, this? Now, this is more like test problem, quiz problem range. It's in no way, this is going to be the problem you hope to see on the next test, because it's, it's going to be easy relative to what we're going to be doing later. But this is the level of power rule problem that I would ask on a test probably. It's going to be. So when I when I started class off, 
we did the x squared and there were some people that said 2x you'd obviously seen that before yes somewhere um there's a way to do this with something called the quotient rule so if you've seen the quotient rule you could do it that way we have not seen the quotient rule all right because the quotient rule is not till the next section all right but i'll say this even with the quotient rule in my toolbox i would not use the quotient rule on this i would use what i'm about to do so what i'm noticing here is that everything i have is a power of x well except this one's a constant well it's x to the zero next to it right but they're all powers of x on the bottom is a power of x and it's a single term that's the key it's a single term the fact that the bottom is a single term means that I can split this into one, two, three, four separate fractions, right? Each one of them over x squared, x squared, x squared. Then once I do that, I'm going to be able to resolve that each one of those is a power of x. And then I can apply the power rule. What you cannot do, and which I see people do, is you say, oh, derivative of this is 15x squared. Derivative of this, you have a negative here. 1 over 2 root x over here one third something blah 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 over here zero and then they put divided by what 2x completely wrong completely wrong it does not work that way it's what's nice about the derivative is that if you have things added and subtracted you can do them one by one what's not good about the derivative is that if you have a fraction a quotient where you've got x's up there and x's down here the derivative is not just derivative of, in, of top and bottom separately. It's not. It's much more complicated than that. And I'll have to prove that to you, and it'll be next class. If it were that way, Cal 1 would be a lot easier, and Cal 2 would be much easier. Okay? Much, much easier. If it worked that way, but it doesn't. So please don't make that mistake of just going, you know, derivative, 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 done. Okay? Can't do it. So let me rewrite it. Notice I'm not doing a derivative yet. 5x cubed over x squared minus square root of x over x squared plus cube root of x over x squared plus 2 over x squared. That's only if there's one term. If there's two, we're screwed right now. <laughs> Until next class. Until next class, really. I mean, we don't have a way of doing it yet. We will. But if we get this case, we're happy, okay? Because we see one term, oh, we split it, we're, we're all good to go. So this is a very special case. And I put it on the test for a reason, right? I put these on test for a reason. There's a lot of things that have to happen correctly here for you. You have to see you can split it. Right? You don't come through and just derivative, derivative. You know, if you do that, that's a major, major mistake. Um, you split it up. Now you have to resolve all, all these powers. This is showing me that you are, you are comfortable with all these exponents and fractions because you've got to clean it up. And then after that, you apply the rule. So let's try this. What's uh, 5x cubed over x squared? What do you do to these exponents? Subtract. 3 minus 2? is 1, right? So this is really just 5x to the first power. Now, over here, I'm not quite ready to do the simplification yet. I'll help you out. I'm going to do x to the half over x squared. The next one, I'm going to do x to the one-third over x squared. The next one, I'm going to do, hmm, I don't know what I'm going to do. What should I do? Not half, but yes, bring it up. Just bring it up. It'll be the 2 that's up there. X is going to come up there and join it. It's going to be negative 2. Right? 2 over X squared means 2X to negative 2. So I did the, the one on the end because I could. I did this one because I could. I did those kind of mentally. The ones in the middle, I had to rewrite the roots first. Now I have to come through and use exponent properties. I take this number, I subtract this number. What's one half take away two? One half take away two. 
one half take away two. Common denominator, negative three halves. Right? Negative three halves. So I have not, right? I have not taken a derivative, right? Everything I'm doing right now is purely algebra. X to the, what do we say? Negative three halves, right? What about the next one? I have a plus sign there. What's one third take away two? Negative five sixths. So this is where you do a little note to yourself, like I need to go practice fraction stuff, get back on track, or you're like happy. I, I just went off of what I, so we're not happy with that or not? Okay, so what should I put? Five eighths? Five thirds, okay. So how are we doing this? Making you second guess yourself, right? Minus uh, two. Common denominator, 3, so you multiply top and bottom here by 3, that's really a 2 over 1, so 1 third minus what, 6 thirds, now just do the tops, 1 minus 6, negative 5 over 3. And then the last one, just nothing, right, we were, we were okay there. That is, that is the function rewritten, now derivative time. What is the derivative of 5x? Five, 5. Because we cover up the 5, we say what's the derivative of, of x? 1 times 5 is 5. Power rule here. Cover up the negative. Bring the negative 3 halves out, right? Now, if you're comfortable with this, you can just realize that these two are going to multiply, right? Negative 3 halves times, this is really like a negative 1. So plus three halves, x to the negative five halves, because you have to subtract one from the power. What about the next one? Minus five thirds, x to the negative eight thirds. Last one, negative four, x to the negative Three, negative cubed, that's fine. Remember, you're subtracting one from negative two. Negative two, take away one, you're at negative three. All right, and that's it. We won't clean that up, okay? We'll just leave it, let it be. Question? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, I think this is good. We've made some progress, but there are more stuff here. Now, these, the remaining ones I put on here, they don't appear in this section. I don't believe they do. They appear later, but I thought I would put them, give them to you now. Because we talked about this last class. The derivative of sine, didn't we say it was cosine? When we graphed them, and I said derivative of cosine is not quite sine. It's off by a sine. And then these right here are things you will have to memorize you will at some point have these memorized, all right? The first two you should have memorized by next class. These should be memorized by the end of next class, no. Um, you know, maybe within the next two weeks you should have these memorized. So it's kind of like when you walked into to Cal 1, I should have been able to go to everyone in this class, sit you down and go, What's cosine of pi over 2? And you should have just real quick been able to spit back the answer, right? Well, everyone here should know what the derivative of sine is. It should just be automatic. And the derivative of cosine. So what I'm going to do now, before I let you go, which we're almost there, is I'm going to show you that the derivative of sine is cosine, not with the picture, but with the limit. So check this out. Again, this is what differentiates business Cal from Cal 1. 
is we're going to show you where this formula comes from. I want to know what the derivative is, right? So what's the definition? The definition, it's limit, right? h goes to 0, f of x plus h. So what happens if you plug x plus h into the sine function? You get sine of x plus h, right, in there? And then minus, now the top right corner of the dis uh, difference quotient would be sine x, all of this over h, just like that, right? And now we need to figure out what happens here. And this is part of why you took pre-cal. You had a formula in your pre-cal for the sum and difference. They were called sum difference formulas for sine and cosine. It was like sine of u plus sine of v. So you've got it right there, right? It's on, I just want to be able to tell everyone where it is on here. It should be on our pre-cal page. Yep, hold on, hold on. I think that's it in the bottom. Uh, Oh, no. Okay, here it is. This is this page two, reference page. Page two, top uh, middle right side. Okay, it's called the addition and subtraction formulas. So according to the addition and subtraction formulas, this is equal to the limit as h goes to zero of sine, what would it be according to that formula? I know not everyone's got the formulas, but sine x, cosine, in this case it would be our h, then plus what? Cosine x, sine h. That's the formula for, for sine of x plus h. Make sure you don't do this. This is not sine x plus sine h, right? You just distribute the sign through? No. That's rookie mistake, yeah. There are certain things that are worthy of punishment by the math gods. That's one of them. <laughs> right? I made, I made a mistake in my Cal 2 class the other day, and I didn't catch it. It was a, I took a pre-cal formula. It was a power-reducing formula. Sine squared x equals 1 half minus 1 half cosine 2x. That formula, I mean, it's like written in the back of my head. I, and for some reason, I, I was typing up the notes, and I accidentally put an x in there somewhere, and it shouldn't have been there. And then I did the rest of the whole problem based on that mistake. So when I came back and I let them know, I, you know, I told them that, when I get to the math gods at the end of my life, when I'm judged by the math gods, they will, I will deserve the punishment that I get for that because I shouldn't make a mistake like that. What's that? I might be, I might be just for that mistake. I feel, I feel like I deserve it. Now, for you in here, you know, I guess that wouldn't make you think of it that way, you know. You're not thinking... Gods are going to punish you for it. But I will punish you on the test if you <laughs> distribute a sign through there, right? That's a major flaw. All right, so what happens here? I don't see anything canceling. How are we going to get those H's to go away? Like, what in the world is happening here, right? So check this out. I'm going to recognize that I have a sine X here and a sine X here, right? So follow me if you can. I'm going to rewrite this. I'm just going to rearrange things. I know. <laughs> All over h plus limit h goes to 0 cosine x sine h. So here's what I've done. I've taken the terms that I have in yellow here, right? I put them next to each other. I did sine x cosine h minus sine x, right there. Then this cosine x sine h was, was separate, right? So I broke it into two separate fractions, which creates two separate limits. Oh, I forgot the h over here, over h. Do you all see that? Yes or no? 
Yes? Okay. On the first one, there's a sine x, right? On both? I'm going to factor it out. And I'm not going to take it out of the limit. I could if I want to, but I'm just going to do this. And then on the other one, I'm not going to factor anything really out. I'm just going to put this cosine x out in front to kind of stress something to you. So I just pulled this sine x out, dropped it in front, rewrote what was left. Right, Because I pulled the sine from here, I'm left with a 1. Pulled the sine from here, I'm left with cosine h. Anyone see it? This is, remember the, the um, notes, I gave you a quiz, here are the two formulas every Cal student should, two limits. This was one of them. That limit goes to what? As h goes to 0, what does that go to? 0. And then sine h over h, this was the junk over junk. If h goes to 0, this goes to 1. So if this goes to 0, doesn't it kill this whole thing? And then all that's left over here, if this goes to 1, is what? Cosine x. So your answer is just cosine x. If you do the derivative of cosine, it's the same way, except that you have a negative that factors out, and so that's why you get a negative sign. All right. Oh, I graded your quizzes from last time, but I was having the problems with my touchpad thing here, and it wasn't working, so I wasn't able to put the grades in. So if you want to know your grade before you leave, you can come look at it, but i got to keep them. If you don't care, you, you know, I'll hand them back next time. I'll post the grades later. Um, let me give you your homework assignment, 2-3. Anybody have anything good planned this weekend? Yeah. Okay, we'll keep this kind of... Oh, this is page 105. Let's see, 1 through 25 odds. Now, I will point out a couple of things here. If, if you have something like this, A of S equals S to the fourth, then S is your variable, yes? So the derivative of this function would be what? 4S cubed. Now, compare that to this. f of x equals ax squared plus bx. What is, what's the a, the capital A, and the capital B there? They're just constants, all right? The, the reason you know that x is the variable is because it's implied there. So what's the derivative of that? 2ax plus b. That's it. That happens a few times in the in the book. They'll have letters in there. You're like, what are those letters? Well, they're just constants. All right. Can I have two, three minutes of your time? Thank you. Just three minutes of your time. It, we still officially are in class. But I can knock this out right now. How many of you remember this from... College algebra, that if you're given a parabola, if you want to find the vertex, right? Remember the vertex? It was like that highest point on the graph or lowest point on the graph. Remember that? That you could do like completing the square or you could do a formula. Do you remember this formula? H was negative B over 2A. Do you remember that? H was negative B over 2A. And then you could get K, the other coordinate, by just plugging that answer into the function. Do you know Show of hands or just, yes, yes, you remember that. Okay, check this out. If you look at a parabola either this way or this way, doesn't matter, can you tell me what the slope of the tangent line is right there? 
zero. Slope tangent line here is zero. Do you mean to tell me that if I want to find the top or bottom of a parabola, I just need to figure out where the slope of the tangent line is zero? You mean that I just need to figure out where the derivative is zero? Yes? That's all I need to figure out? What is the derivative of this function? Remember, a, b, and c are constants. What is it? 2ax plus b. What's the derivative of c? Zero. Now, what did you need the derivative to be equal to? Zero. Set it equal to zero. Solve for x. Move your b over. What do you get? 2ax equals negative b. Divide by 2a. And you get x is equal to negative b over 2a. In other words, the h was the x-coordinate of the vertex, right? It's just setting the quadratic function's derivative equal to zero and solving. That's all it is. Now, it gets more complicated if your function is not quadratic, but you can see how that might happen. Yes? So there's where the formula comes from. Uh, that's it. You have your homework. There's nothing else for to do here. Get out of here. I don't know why you're still here. <laughs>